surprisingly, we're like right on schedule. I don't even know how that happened, but we did. Um, <clears throat> so we talked about moles, the chapter eight. We then talked about equations and using moles and equations with simple solids that we can then measure and do all those fun little conversions with. So we could go back and do more examples. We've done a couple of these. Do you want to look at more of those? Sure. Sure? Okay. Um, I don't think we've looked at this last one. What was that last one? Uh, I don't think we did that one. Did we do that one, the very last one there? That one new? A mass in grams of sodium hydrogen carbonate produced when two moles of CO2 are consumed. So let's get some working space here. Uh, what do we need to be able to answer that question? And that, that uh, answering that may be a little bit more difficult than you may consider. Okay. Um, with experience, you might think, well, we need a balanced equation. Okay. But if you don't have that experience, you may not know. So set it up. What are we trying to get to? Um, the grams of sodium hydrogen carbonate. What are we starting with? So if we just set it up like this, we're now trying to make the left equal the right. And we can do whatever we want on the left to make it look like the right. What do you notice has changed as we compare left to right? The substance has changed. Well, if the substance changes, how would we figure that out? Where's our relationship, our unit factor for dealing with changing a substance come from? Or moles? Well, moles doesn't allow me to change substance. A balanced reaction equation. Okay. Or Jake, for sure. <laughs> Right. So we have to look for our balanced reaction equation to determine if the substance changes. What else did we notice changes? What's that? The unit change. We went from moles to grams. Right. Where do we find a mole to gram conversion? That's off the periodic table. So by looking at just what changed, it's now where do we find that information, and now how do we then manipulate it? Okay. If we were just given that question, would you be able to answer it? Okay. Two moles of CO2 consumed in what? Okay. I need to know that reaction. I need to know what I'm looking at. Okay. So we have to have the equation given in some format. It can either be explicitly given, as it is above, or it could be given implicitly when we said hydrogen reacts with oxygen to form water. Well, we've converted the equation into English, and you have to translate the English into the equation to then manipulate. Okay? So let's say we're given that equation. Okay? What should we do as our first step? So we've got several different directions we could go. And the first thing I heard was try and get rid of moles of CO2. Ideally, what, a, what would I get? What would I hope to get for my answer of this? I want grams of sodium hydrogen carbonate. But the problem is, is I can't do that conversion. Okay? To change substance, I have to be in units of moles. Okay, from a balanced equation, stupid eraser. So I could get this into moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Okay. Could I also take it to grams of CO2? No. Yeah, I could. 
Does that get me closer or further from my answer? Fortunately, it gets me further because to convert substances, what unit must I be in? Moles. So while I'm going into grams, and that's a valid conversion, that doesn't get me closer to the end result because the only way I can change from CO2 into sodium hydrogen carbonate is through that mole unit. So going into grams doesn't help me, okay? at least not yet. Maybe it would eventually. So I could go into now moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Well, this is now a mole-mole ratio. The only thing I'm changing now is the substance. Mm -hmm. To change the substance, I need, I need the balanced reaction equation. So I can go back up to the equation and say, OK, well, what are my coefficients? For the sodium hydrogen carbonate, what's my coefficient? One. One. And for the CO2? What was that, Hannah? Some jerk, while you weren't paying attention, went through and carefully erased. And we're not looking at the Brie, we're looking at the Re. We have to make sure the equation is balanced. Is that equation actually balanced? No. There's two sodiums on the left. There's only one sodium on the right. So I would need a two on the right. I should then go through and check every other element to make sure it's balanced. And what I should find is now it is balanced. Now that it is balanced, I can use the coefficients because it is the balanced equation. And the coefficients are now, with the incorrect eraser, what? Two moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate is one mole of CO2. Okay. The coefficients must come from the balanced equation. You are responsible for balancing. That was chapter 7. Okay. So we are layering more and more and more stuff on. What we've been looking at within the class is stuff that already had some of that done for you, so you didn't have to work quite as hard. Okay. By the end of the semester, you have to do all of that. You're responsible for each of those steps. Okay. What unit would we now be in? moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Is that the answer we want? No. no. So I need to get rid of the unit moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate, so that needs to show up on the bottom. What unit would I ideally go to? Grams of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Grams of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Okay. Where do I find that information? The gram to mole relationship for one substance is on the periodic table. And I could go through and total that up. The mass for sodium, being the awesome sig fig keeper I am, is 23. Hydrogen is 1. Carbon is 12. Oxygen is 16. But there's three oxygens. Did you guys say that was 84 last time? Yeah? Cool. Yeah, 84.01. <laughs> Same thing as last time. <laughs> Just gotta keep it consistent. 84.01 grams in one mole. Right, what unit would I now have? Grams of sodium hydrogen. I would have the grams of sodium hydrogen carbonate. I can now go through to do this calculation. As far as what I personally do for entering it into the calculator, I take everything in the numerator and I multiply it through. If I happen to be able to do that calculation quickly and easily in my head, sometimes I'll do that. For instance, 2 times 2, pretty good at that one, is 4, times 84.01 divided by, well, 1 times 1 times 1 is 1, and then enter it into my calculator, 1 times 1 times 1 is 1. Wouldn't you divide by 2 instead of... Oh, never mind. Sorry. Okay. So 4 times 84 is... 336. That's my numerator. The denominator, I go through and calculate it, came out to be 1. If it wasn't 1, I can divide by 1 pretty easily. But if it wasn't 1, now I would do 336 divided by the denominator, and I would get my answer of 336. 
because I did all the unit work already, grams, sodium, hydrogen, carbonate, and now I'd have to go back and evaluate sig figs and be really irritated that I had to lose a whole bunch of sig figs. Okay. For most calculations on an exam, you're running three sig figs. Okay. It is very rare to do anything other than three sig figs. Okay. Make sense? If we go back to how the question was written, which was poorly, it says when two moles, the only numerical value given is that measurement. How many sig figs in that measurement? Only one. That's a measurement, which means the answer has to be reported to one sig fig. It would become 300 grams. Questions on that? I'm, I'm super confused about the sig figs and zeros. Um, so with, if it was 300.0, then it would be three sig figs, right? So let's take a look at some numbers. For possible ways to write out this if we were asking it as a sig fig question. So number one, the value that we're starting with is two moles. How many sig figs in that? One sig fig. So let's look at some multiple choice answers. In black, 336. We're going to ignore the units, just assume the units are all fine. 336. Answer A. Answer B, 330. Answer C, 300. Answer D, 300.0, because I heard that one. Uh, answer E, Uh, there we go, 400. Okay. We started with one sig fig, which means our answer needs to be reported to one sig fig. How many sig figs in answer choice A? One, two, three sig figs. How many ans or sig figs in answer choice B? Two. Two. Okay. Here's where I would argue your first question comes up, because you said sig figs and zeros. Now we have a zero. Now we can evaluate. Is that zero a significant digit? Yeah. No. no. Well, clearly we said the answer was two. Okay, so why? I need to have a decimal point. Maybe. If I have a decimal point, then for the zero to be significant, what has to be true? A number to the left of it must be a significant digit. Well, there is no decimal point, so why are we talking about decimal points? That was stupid. We don't have a decimal point. If there's no decimal point, for the zero to be significant, what has to be true? I have to have a significant digit anywhere to the left yeah. and anywhere to the right. Are there any significant digits to the right of that zero? Yeah. No. So the zero is not significant. That means only two sig figs. Yeah. Go to answer choice C. How many sig figs? One. There's only one. For the same reason that B was two, C is only one sig fig. What about D? Four sig figs because decimal point means I just have to have a significant digit to the left. Is that a significant digit? Yes. Is that? Yes. Is that? Yes. Four sig figs. Right. E? One sig fig. So if we go through and clean up our answers, only two answers had one sig fig. So all the other ones are by definition wrong, so I can erase those. Between those two answers, which one's the correct one? C, because what my calculator spit out was the 336. The 3 is my significant digit. The first insignificant digit is less than 5, which means I don't do anything, and I mark them out as zeros, as unsignificant zeros. Make sense? So if it were... Okay, so because of the hypothetical, first thing we're going to have to do is erase everything. Sure. Okay, we cannot look at anything we wrote because you're now making an entirely different hypothetical question. 0 0.03. How many sig figs? Two. It's two. <clears throat> one. Thank you. There's only one sig fig. Why? Because 
decimal point, the zero must have a significant digit to the left. There isn't a significant digit there, which means the zero is not significant. There's only one sig fig. Well, what if we did this? Well, now I still just look to the left of it. There's still nothing there. No sig fig. It's still one sig fig. Okay. It is going back and using the sig fig rules and applying them through. Okay. Questions on that? Okay. Now we move into the next part because, of course, as soon as we get some basic rough idea of maybe I know what I'm doing, we throw a monkey wrench at you and you've got to make it harder. So the first thing we're going to do is look at water, right? and in particular, solubility. Right? So water is an interesting molecule because it generates these things called hydrogen bonds. Uh, which your textbook is showing there in this nice little image is those dotted lines, or those white little dot, dotted spheres. Okay. And we call those hydrogen bonds. What types of bonds do we have? Covalent? Ionic? Ionic? Polar covalent. So when you said covalent, okay, Hopefully you were saying that under my context, which means nonpolar covalent. Right? We just got lazy about the nonpolar. So there's three types of bonds. That was ionic, that was polar covalent, and that was nonpolar covalent. None of which are called hydrogen bonds. Well, what type of bond is hydrogen bond? It's a trick question. It isn't. Hydrogen bonding is not a bond. Why the heck does the concept of hydrogen bonding show up in our bonding chapter? Because some smart aleck called them hydrogen bonds, and then the place something that is not a bond in a bonding chapter to make everybody more confused about the topic. Hydrogen bonding is not a bond, period. Right? It is a horrible use of that word. Right? Unfortunately, no one is going to change that. Right? So we have to work within those limits. Hydrogen bonding happens to be an extremely strong force. Right? It's such a strong force because when we look at an individual actual bond in water, we are connecting oxygen to hydrogen. And what do we know about oxygen and hydrogen, in particular oxygen? Oxygen is the second most electronegative element on the periodic table, which means what does it do to the bonding electrons? It steals them, which then means the oxygen has gained an extra electron and it becomes negative. Well, if the oxygen stole the electron, where did it steal it from? From the hydrogen. So the hydrogen lost an electron, so it became positive. So we have a cation and an anion. That would mean that bond is ionic. Is that an ionic bond? No. So what we're trying to address here is not that those are ionic, but that we're getting close to being an ionic bond. Okay? We're getting as close as we can possibly be to being an ionic bond without actually being ionic. That's why we call it a polar covalent bond. And what we're trying to do is address those charges, those partial charges, because we aren't formally there. How can we show that we are partially becoming charged? Well, we invent a new notation. We use a lowercase delta symbol, because what did delta represent? Change. What are we looking at here? The change in the balance of the electrons on that atom. The change means that the hydrogen becomes positively charged in this bond, the oxygen becomes negatively charged. And what we now have is our partial charge notation. Right. Do we like charge? Okay. About our everyday lives, we're talking about radicals. Okay. Some radical person comes at you, and you're like, oh yeah, whatever, I totally love the radicals. Give me some more radicals. No, you tend to be afraid of radicals because they're some scary people. What's coming out of the wall? Charge. 
That's why we don't stick our finger in the wall, because that hurts. The charge runs through us, okay? and not like that sappy movie. <laughs> a, river, a river runs... No. <laughs> so we've got charge. Charge is inherently bad. Chemistry thinks the same thing. So what do all molecules try to do? Neutralize that charge. So what does that positively charged hydrogen on that water molecule try to do? Neutralize. How does a positive charge become neutral? It gets near a negative charge. Well, let's look at what happens when it gets near another water molecule. What are they showing the interaction between? The hydrogen and another oxygen. Those charges are attracting to attempt to neutralize. So we're generating a very, very strong force, not a bond, but a really strong attractive force between those. And it's strong because we have a very large negative, because oxygen is the second most electronegative element, and hydrogen is one of the lowest electronegativities. So we get this large charge differential. That means that those two atoms now have a very strong attraction between each other, and we can call that strong attraction a hydrogen bond because it involves hydrogen. And it involves bonds? Sure, why not? Okay, but it is not an actual bond. Okay. That intermolecular force and a lot of other characteristics of water, it being symmetrical, make it an insanely powerful molecule. Okay. There are large considerations or large reasons potential reasons for why life exists on this planet, and that is largely due to water. Okay. So if we're looking for life somewhere else, it is very, very highly likely that life will be found in the presence of water, which is why when we go out to other planets, what do we look for? Water. Because it's the molecule that is facilitating almost everything we deal with. There's a lot of bizarre properties that go along with that molecule. People earn PhDs staring at water. Okay? It's a little bit more artful than that, but it's pretty close. Okay? So lots of neat things happen there. One of the biggest things that we use for water is that we use it as a solvent. It dissolves virtually everything we look at. Why? Those large partial charges. Okay? Those large partial charges can interact with other large partial charges and dissolve those compounds, like Salt. So if we take solid salt and add water, what happens? Well, the salt dissolves. How does the salt dissolve? Uh-oh, come on. Maybe it's working. Do I have a positive? We take the positive ions in our salt, like sodium, and those positive ions hook up with the partial negative charge to cancel out the neutral charge on the oxygen. The chloride as a large negative charge interacts with the hydrogen. So by bringing those charges near each other, they can cancel out and dissolve the compound. So we can look at, do those charges balance? Okay. It's not quite as simple as that, because there is an attractive force between sodium and chloride. It just so happens that water helps to break that force. Is that true for all compounds? No. For instance, what happens if we take a look at, say, silver chloride? What happens when I add water to that? Nothing happens. I get silver chloride and water. Okay. Well, maybe the phases change. Water, what's the phase for water? Liquid. What is the phase for silver chloride? Solid. When we go through and react it, we could say, well, maybe it becomes aqueous. If that happens, did it dissolve? Yeah. yeah. Does silver chloride dissolve? Okay. 
So you all might be saying no. Of course, you're going to get the next question. Why? And somebody's cheating or looked ahead or it's just knows the answer. That's fine. It's on there? It's not on. Oh, okay. You just knew it. Good job. <laughs> We'd have to use our solubility rules, which we learned about in Chapter 7 when we looked at what type of reaction. You can't answer, by the way. <laughs> Where were our solubility rules important? The double replacement reactions. Okay? So we can predict something about the solubility of our compounds using solubility rules, and we can then look at phases and all that fun stuff. Okay? So, some solubility curves. Okay? What does this mean? If we take a look at this curve, if we start right down here at the bottom, right about there, that dot. What does that red dot mean? So you're looking at the y value. The y value of that point is roughly 175. The x value is 0. Okay. What are the units on that 0? So at, degr at degrees Celsius, at 0 degrees Celsius, what are the units on my 175? That's the grams of whatever my solute is, which in this case is sugar in 100 milliliters of water. I have the solubility. That much compound dissolves. What happens if I somehow got up here? What did I do? I made Coke. Not that Coke. Let's try that again. <laughs> I made soda, okay, or pop, depending on your cultural relevance. Okay. What happened there? Go for it, Ingle. I have more sugar than what? Not necessarily than the original. That line is the maximum amount of sugar that I can dissolve in 100 grams of water. If I have that point, what did I do? I dissolved more sugar in that solution than is physically possible. So when you say you dissolved water? Uh, no, because your water is still in a larger amount. Okay. okay. Well, how is that possible? Because we add in a bunch of other junk into our soda pop to help keep the water or keep the sugar dissolved. Okay. We are beyond the solubility limit of sugar in water when we move into soda. That's kind of nuts. Okay? That's why it tastes so sweet. Okay? How could we reference that? We want to come up with a name. We can say, well, that's stupidly dissolved. Uh, that's not very science-y. What can we come up with? Super saturated. We've exceeded, there's our super, the saturation limit of sugar in that solution. What happens if, uh, I don't know, we look at a cup of tea, <laughs> British tea? Uh, well, I mean, really, I mean, British tea is probably up there, too. Well, you know, normal person tea, <laughs> maybe down here. What's happened there? I have less sugar dissolved in the solution than it can physically handle. Okay, which means I'm underneath the saturation limit. I am unsaturated. Okay. We have to be a little bit careful with the terms saturated and unsaturated. Depending on the context, we're referencing different things. So if you go onto the internet and say define unsaturated, they might talk about the ratio of hydrogen to carbon. What does that have to do with solubility? Nothing. That has nothing to do with it. That term is used in its different context of organic chemistry. So be careful when looking at different references. The saturation that we are referring to is talking about the ability for a substance to dissolve in a solvent. Okay? We can be super saturated. We've added so much stuff to it okay, that it is physically higher than what it can possibly contain. Okay? You've actually done a lab that probably didn't work 
looking at supersaturation. Okay, it was the um, macadamia nut lab, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah, the very first part where you had the sodium acetate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what were you supposed to see when you added a little crystal? A bunch of crystals were supposed to come out because the solution you made was supersaturated. By adding just a little bit more, you added the last straw to the camel's back and it crashed out a solution in a massive amount. Okay. The solution finally caught wind of, hey, there's too much stuff in here, and it spit it all out. What did it spit out? That amount to get down to the saturated level. Okay. An unsaturated solution isn't particularly interesting because, well, you can just keep adding stuff to it to dissolve it. So whoop de doo okay. Saturated is just kind of your middle point. That's the most that you can theoretically fit in it. Okay. If you tweak the system, sometimes you can exceed that. Okay. Um, what are we looking at here? So we're now looking at the same kind of thing. It's still solubility versus temperature, but we're now noticing a whole bunch of other substances. Notice that not all substances have the same solubility in water, okay? which we knew because silver chloride doesn't really dissolve. Okay? So we do get different relationships. And it's not always a perfect positive negative makes it dissolve. Take a look at sodium chloride. Sodium chloride dissolves relatively high amount, or what we would have assumed to be a high amount. And yet, if we heat up potassium chloride, we can get more to dissolve. If we look at sodium nitrate, that dissolves ridiculous amounts in water. It's way off the top of our chart. Take a look at a general trend. What do you observe? of all of those lines. In general, as you increase the heat, what happens to the solubility? It increases. What happens when we increase heat? Uh, just in general. I have an ice cube. I increase the heat. What happens? It melts into a liquid. I increase the heat. It turns into a gas. Okay, we haven't quite gotten there yet, but what we're breaking are the intermolecular forces that are holding those individual molecules together. When we dissolve something, what are we doing? Same thing. The exact same thing. So what would you expect to happen if we increase the heat? Well, we're breaking intermolecular forces. It should dissolve more. That makes physical sense. Do all things do that? No. Of course, we had to go all sorts of weird cerium sulfate Okay? actually decreases solubility with temperature. That is fairly rare. Most molecules, when you heat them up, start to fall apart. That's exactly what's happening when we dissolve things. Okay? So as a general trend, increase the heat, you increase the solubility. Of solids. Okay? I said, well, why is that a big deal? What happens if we increase the heat? What happens to the solubility of a gas? Okay. Anybody left your soda in the car, soda can, in the car during our Arizona summers? Yeah, what would you come back to? Explosion. A giant explosion. Why? Because the gas is inside the can got excited. You heated it up so much that what did all the gas that was dissolved in your soda do? Expand to get out of the liquid. It expanded enough that it actually had a structural failure of the can and exploded your soda all over the car. Okay. So what happens when we add heat to a gas solution? It expands out. We reduce solubility. Well, but I thought when we added heat, we increased solubility. Solids. For solids. When we add heat to a solid, what does it become? A liquid. When we take a solid and we dissolve it in a, in a liquid, what is it starting to mimic? A liquid. Both of those are doing the exact same transition. What happens when I add heat to a gas? Does it become a liquid? No, it becomes more gas. Okay. If I'm trying to now add that gas into the liquid, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to make the gas a liquid. Temperature-wise, what do I need to do? 
decrease the temperature to actually get it to dissolve. If I increase the temperature, all I'm going to do is keep pushing it to the gas state. Right? So we can look at those kind of manipulations and see what's changing as we do those processes to predict something about solubility of varying species within there. We haven't talked about gases yet. We might get to it by the end of the day. We'll see what happens with the next few slides. And by slides, I think it's the next one. Uh, not quite. So if we now take our substances and we dissolve them in water, this is cool because I can now mix those different solutions and get those reagents to react with each other. So for instance, I can take aluminum bromide, which in and of itself is a solid. Okay? I can dissolve it in water. And then I can take silver nitrate, which is also a solid, and dissolve it in water and then mix them. Well, why would I dissolve them in water? Why don't I just take those two solids and put them in the same space? What's that? Uh, kind of, sort of. How do two molecules interact or react? What do they have to do first? Uh, different than energy, easier. Easier. How do you interact with your significant other? Yeah, you have to touch. Okay. If there's no touch, there's no interaction. What has to happen with those individual reagents? They have to touch. If they're both solids, where do they touch? Only on the surface of the solid. If we now dissolve them into solution, now where can they touch? Everywhere. We increase the likelihood that a reaction will occur, or the speed it will occur at, by keeping them in the same phase, or the same liquid mobile phase. Okay? If they're different phases, we don't get a good interaction. Okay? So dissolving them in a solvent, like water, is an awesome thing to do. Okay? We can then run the reaction. We can see silver bromide as a solid. It precipitates out a solution. We go, yay. We have a precipitate. That means chemical reaction has occurred, because I have a change in phase. Okay, yippee. Okay, so what type of reaction happened here? Okay, double replacement. How can I quantify the amount of silver bromide produced? I want to quantify it, though. I go into the lab, I run this reaction, I make that. How do I quantify how much silver bromide's there? So I heard something about coefficients. So you go through and you count all the silver bromide? In your reaction flask? OK, no, you don't do that. What do you do? Well, you can see that it's there, but I want to quantify it. I don't want a qualitative in, uh, observation. I want a quantitative observation. How do you quantify silver bromide? What would you do? Another suggestion? Weigh it. Right? Because silver bromide is a solid. And if I want to quantify how much solid I have, I can use a balance to get a weight. Awesome. I like that idea. Okay. When I run this reaction, uh, actually, where did it come from? Where did the silver bromide come from? From the reagents in our reaction, right? Those mixed, and they somehow produced the silver bromide. When we go through and run a reaction, do they always yield 100%? Are they always perfect? No. Okay. So I want to be able to make, I don't know, five grams of silver bromide. How do I know how much stuff to start with? Well, I could use the balanced equation, and will five grams, well, let's make it easy. Let's say three grams, three grams of silver bromide. I want three grams of silver bromide, so I'm going to start with three grams of silver nitrate. Why no? Mm, I know where you're going with that. Conservation of mass doesn't work. Conservation of mass only works in an equation where you have two and one. With two and two, that doesn't quite work out. What ratios? Yes. If I take three grams of silver bromide 
and I want to know how much, uh, say, silver nitrate I started with, mass-wise, what do I have to do? I need to get rid of silver bromide. Ideally, I would have silver nitrate. Let's convert to moles first. But I have to convert to moles first. Do we have to convert to moles? You have to convert to moles. Whoops. Silver bromide. Where do we get that conversion from? Yeah. Periodic table. How do I convert my moles of silver bromide into moles of silver nitrate? That's my coefficient from the balanced equation. But I wanted grams. How do I get grams? Periodic table, grams of silver nitrate, moles of our silver nitrate, whatever that number is. Okay. Periodic table. Right? We just did that. So we just did it with sodium hydrogen carbonate. Okay. So that could tell me the grams of silver nitrate I started with. What does that mean the phase of the silver nitrate is? I measured out a gram amount. Solid. What phase is it in this equation? Aqueous. If I measure out whatever gram amount that gives me, is that going to be of silver nitrate? What is it going to be of? Silver nitrate and water. Is water producing this? No. Okay. So I need to know how much silver nitrate was in that water solution. Because when I measure out the solution, I'm going to need to measure out the volume. So what does that mean I'm going to need? I need another conversion factor. I need a conversion factor that tells me how much silver nitrate is dissolved in how much solution. Okay? That conversion factor takes on a variety of forms. The most common one is molarity, which is written typically as capital M. Right? You should instantly, anytime you see capital M, immediately cross it out and write moles over liters. So if I tell you you have a three molar solution of silver nitrate, that becomes three moles of silver nitrate per one liter, technically, solution of silver nitrate. Why the one? If it was anything other than one, would it be three? No. Okay. The one is acting just as a placeholder, just like we've done in every other one of our conversions. Okay. Could we use other ones? Yes. Grams per liter shows up. Kilograms per liter shows up. Okay. Why are we picking moles per liter instead of one of those other units? What do you mean it's easier to convert between them? How do we convert our substances? Through moles. So if my conversion factor starts with moles, I simplify my calculation. Okay? So we'll almost always see our values written out as moles. This means we now have an extra thing that we can go through and calculate and manipulate within our solutions. So should we do one together? Okay. What is the molarity of a solution containing 24.0 grams of sodium hydroxide in 0 0.100 liters of solution. Multiple approaches, but what I would suggest you do is stick with the standard notation that we've been working with. What do we want for an answer? We want molarity, which we could write as capital M, but as I suggested, we should write moles over Liter. Moles of what? Moles of sodium hydroxide over liters of solution of sodium hydroxide. What am I starting with? 
Right. Actually, I, I like where you're starting with that, Aspen, because you actually picked the harder one to start with. Okay. There are two numbers given here. Okay. I could start with grams or I could start with liters. Either one. I personally would probably start with the liters because my answer needs liters. Where does the liter show up in my answer? On the bottom, which means where should I place my 0.1 liters of solution? What goes on top of it? One. I don't want to change the number. Just putting it in. I now have liters in the denominator. That's awesome. That's beautiful. That's exactly what I want. Except I don't have moles yet. So ideally, I would then just multiply by moles with something in the numerator. Am I given moles? No, I'm given grams of sodium hydroxide. What is that over? One. Okay. It says 24.0 grams of sodium hydroxide. It does not say 24.0 grams of sodium hydroxide in one mole of sodium hydroxide. It just says 24 grams of sodium hydroxide. There is no extra unit that goes underneath it, okay? and the number can't change. If I did this calculation, I'd end up with grams per liter. Is that what I want? So what do I need to do? I need to convert. I need to get rid of grams of sodium hydroxide. And I need moles of sodium hydroxide on top. Where do I find that information? I go to the periodic table. Sodium. Yeah, if you're going to tell me the stupid number like that, fine. 22 point, 20, yeah, 22 point, what, 99? Plus R16. Plus 1.01. .01. 40.00 grams of sodium hydroxide in one mole of sodium hydroxide. Where does the 40 show up in my equation? No. With the grams of sodium hydroxide, which is what I figured you were trying to say. Hi. How do I run the calculation? Because several people have been asking about how to enter it into the calculator. We'll work through it. I would take 1 times 24 times 1. Mathematically, I'm okay with that. It's just writing 24.00. Okay, over 0.1 times 1 times 40. Uh, arguably, I could do a little shift of the decimal place, but I tend to screw that up, so I'll enter it into the calculator. 0.1 times 40 is... 4.00. Now that I have the numerator and denominator, I'll take the numerator, 24, divide by the denominator, and I would argue that I would probably enter it into the calculator again anyway. And I'd get 6.00. Because I already did all the unit work, liters, whoa, does not cancel. Grams of sodium hydroxide cancel. And I end up with the units of moles per liter. And my answer would come out to be 6.00 molar. Was that the proper sig figs? No. 24.0 is 3 sig figs. 3 sig figs. If, if this is like a short answer on the test, would you accept it in moles over liters form? Or do we need to? I, so, short answer, good question. So in a short answer question, what would I expect as your answer to be reported as? 6.00 moles of sodium hydroxide per one liter of sodium hydroxide or 6.00 capital M sodium hydroxide? Both. Okay, cool. They're equivalent. They're the exact same answer. So you have to have sodium hydroxide on there. You, oh, good. Touche. Yes. <laughs> you need to specify sodium hydroxide. Right, to be fully correct. I didn't give you credit on that quiz before because of that, so it shouldn't let me get away with it. Make sense? Okay, your turn. So let's take a look. Okay. 
What do we want for an answer? Spiel, okay. Potassium dichromate. It's one of those complex ions that you'd have to know. I didn't ask you to memorize it. You'd just have to look it up, know how to use it. Okay, what did we start with? Ooh, we're given two numbers to start with. So that gets a bit tricky on deciding which one we want to use. Okay, ideally, we would see the gram show up in one of those. It doesn't. Okay, so deciding which of those to use becomes a little bit trickier to deal with. Again, various methods get you through to the answer the exact same way. But what I would try and do is focus on where can I get grams from? From moles. Right? So I know that grams to moles is a valid conversion. I may not know what it is, but I know it exists. Am I given moles as a unit? Kind of. Kind of. That kind of is because we didn't do the first thing that I said you should do. Whenever you see capital M, cross it out and write moles, moles over one liter. So I can convert grams and moles. Ooh, I have moles. I now know what I want to start with. I want to start with that mole value because I know how to convert grams and moles. Right? But where do I place that mole thing? Is it in the numerator or in the denominator? I don't know. So I'm going to guess. Okay? I'm going to guess that it goes in the denominator. For those of you copying what I'm writing, stop. Moles are potassium dichromate. I'm tired of writing that. K R C R. There we go. Potassium dichromate. What's in the numerator? One liter of that solution. Okay. My whole goal was to do what? Convert to grams. Okay. So I need to get rid of moles. So I can get rid of moles by putting moles up top. And where would I put grams? On the bottom. Which would mean grams would show up where in my answer? On the bottom. Where is it supposed to show up? On the, on the top. What does that mean? I started with my molarity in the wrong location. It shouldn't have gone into the denominator. It should have gone into the numerator. Okay. I can reset, and actually I should argue that what you should be doing is going, whoops, cross it out, 0 0.150 moles of my potassium dichromate, one liter of the solution, my moles of potassium dichromate into grams of potassium dichromate. That, as a conversion factor, comes from the periodic table, which involves lots of calculations, because that's an irritatingly long structure. Ooh. Oh, uh, that's fun. I got two different numbers. I heard 300 and I heard a two something. 294 from a lot of people, so that 300 you should take a closer look at. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying the rest of the class said 294. Okay? Over one mole. What unit would I now have? Grams per liter. I don't want grams per liter, I want grams. So what do I have to do? I need to get rid of the liters. Am I given liters? No. So I can't put in a number immediately there. I need a little bit more space. But I could do a conversion. I will convert those liters to milliliters because by propagating a little bit further ahead, I see that I do have milliliters. I could cancel those units. What is the conversion between liters and milliliters? Guaranteed I was going to get that. Milli means 10 to the minus 3. The power of 10 always goes with the core unit. The core unit is liters. 10 to the minus 3 liters is 1 milliliter. What shows up in front of the milliliters in the next step? 
125.0. What goes in the denominator of that number? One. Because if it is anything other than one, it is not 125. If it is a unit of anything other than blank, it is not milliliters. What now happens? My liters of solution cancel, my milliliters cancel, and I'd be left with grams. Multiply everything in the numerator through, multiply everything in the denominator through, divide numerator by denominator, and we'd end up with our final answer. Our group consensus for that answer is... Ooh, that's fun. Should we try that again? <laughs> I had a 5.52. Okay. Three sig figs, which will be correct here because of our molarity. Make sense? Yes. No. That one is there as just kind of a marker or a placeholder to say don't put anything other than one here. Okay. If you do what? If you put nothing there, it is not wrong. Okay. The reason I put it there is if I erase that line, okay, a couple things. One, it looks weird. And then if I got sloppy in my writing because I don't know, I was rushed on a test, where did I write that? No, technically that's still in the numerator, but it looks like it's in the denominator and I could very easily make a mistake. By including that line, I now know it's in the numerator. Okay? It can help clean up some of those sloppy mistakes. Okay? Make sense? Hi. So, what we just went through and did here was effectively our chapter 8 stuff. Okay. We took our conversions, we used moles, we converted things across, got grams, volumes, molarity, liters, we can do all sorts of fun stuff with that. Okay. Where this becomes interesting is that we can layer this on top of another chapter. We could layer it on chapter 9. A chemist needs to determine the concentration of a solution of nitric acid. She puts 745 milliliters of the acid in a flask with an indicator. She then slowly adds 0.2 molar of barium hydroxide to the flask until the solution changes color, indicating the equivalence point. She notes that 165 milliliters of barium hydroxide was needed to reach this point. What was the molarity of the nitric acid? Hi. Those of you going, oh my god, I don't want to do this problem. I'll never have to worry about it. I'll just ignore Mike. Uh, two labs from now, you do this lab. You, you actually do this experiment. So you do kind of need to know how to do it. And if you can figure it out now, when you get to the lab, it's really straightforward. Is this an easy question? No, not by any stretch of the imagination. There is lots of things that are layered into this. Okay? For instance... What do we need to know when we go through and look at this? So one of the first things I would argue, because it's a chemistry class, what do we need? We need a chemical equation. Sorry, little dude. What equation are we looking at? Barium hydroxide. Oh, God, do I really have to write out the name? That's awful. I wish we had a better way to write out names for things. B-A-O-H-2. Why is it O-H-2 and not O-H? Barium is a plus 2. Hydroxide is a minus 1. I need 2 hydroxides to balance that. Oh, crap. That nomenclature thing came back. Yep. Yep, it did. <laughs> Barium hydroxide with? H-N-O-3. Technically aqueous, because we're looking at an acid. How do we come up with that? Oh, yeah, that nomenclature thing again. Okay. To produce. Oh, crap, the equation didn't tell us what it produced. Because we're expected to know what this reaction is going to produce. Double replacement is not a bad way to go with it. I would argue there's a better answer. It's a neutralization. So we would do our exchange. We end up with H and OH. 
plus Ba and NO3. Should that be HOH2? No. Well, there's a 2 over here. Why is the 2 in barium hydroxide? To balance the barium. Okay. So when I go through to predict my products, I will do the exchange and then decide, are those products balanced? What is the charge on hydroxide? Negative 1. What is the charge on hydrogen? Plus 1. Is that equation or that formula balanced? Yes. Yes. Wrong eraser. Okay. Barium and nitrate. I did my exchange. The charge on barium? Plus 2. Charge on nitrate? Minus 1. Is that formula balanced? Nope. What do I need? I need two nitrates. Now that I have my equation, I should balance the whole friggin' equation. Okay? So I have to go through and balance the equation out, and hopefully what you'll see is we need two nitric acids, and we will produce two waters. Okay, cool. So I balanced an equation. yip de doo What do I have to do with that? Okay? Here's where some more information comes into play. Okay? She says she adds until the solution changes color. She's talking about the equivalence point. At the equivalence point, so at equivalence, that says equivalence, these two species are gone. What does that mean? They have chemically reacted with each other in the perfect ratio to eliminate each other to form only products. Okay, so the equivalence point means that those two species have disappeared. Okay, which really means that I can now convert between those species, and I know two moles of nitric acid will be one mole of barium hydroxide. Okay? With that context of extra information, you now have everything you need to solve this, which is where we will set up with what it sounded like Hannah was working on. In teams of four, I don't care how you guys decide to go through and, and do this, but teams of four, and since we're pretty much done, we'll make it due over the weekend, okay? Write your names on any kind of paper that you want to use with your team members on it. You want to come up with a team name, that's cool too, okay? And what I want you to go through and do is develop the process to solve this question. I do not want the answer. I want the process. What did you have to do to solve the question? Okay. Which is ultimately saying everything that we've done for every single question we've ever approached, what did we talk through? The process, the method, that's what I want you to write out for this question. Okay. For those of you trying to count out steps and saying, eh, it probably isn't that bad, depending on how you count, you're in the 15 to 20 steps. Okay. Remember, to balance the question, we still had to predict products, we had to come up with formulas. I mean, there's lots of individual steps within that. You may just be seeing those steps as really simple and trivial, but they are an actual step. Right? When we came up with that equation, what did we need? Barium hydroxide, I needed to name it. Or not in the name, come up with a formula. To come up with a formula, what did I need? Well, to balance out the charges. What did I do for nitric acid? Same thing. Right? So just writing the reactants down, that's probably four steps. Okay? So spend your time over the weekend, get your four people, I don't care which four, okay? realize when you come up with this process, you cannot deviate from the process when solving. I don't care who you talk to to get help with this either. You want to talk to me, you want to talk to tutors. Tutors might be a little bit more helpful than I am because I'll be a jerk. Um, come up with that process. We will talk about that process on Tuesday. Okay.